disinflation definitely, but maybe even deflation is, is the opposite, at least for the time being. Inflation is the end game. It has to be because there's no way uh, out from under the debt. But right now, and people are still worried about inflation. Prices are still going up. I, I put gas in my car just like everyone else. So I'm well aware of it, eggs, bacon, you know, et cetera. But inflation has been coming down steadily since uh, June of, uh, of 2022. So uh, about seven months in a row, eight months in a row. Um, it you know, peaked then. Uh, we all know what gas prices were doing and so forth. But the reason is, is kind of interesting. And inflation, uh, nominally, yeah, prices are going up. Okay, so that's inflation. But it can come from two sources that are opposite. One is from uh, supply side shock, supply chain disruption. We saw that in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo over the Arab-Israeli war at the time. The price of oil quadrupled, et cetera. That was a supply shock. The thing about supply side inflation is it's self-negating. It burns itself out. So, you know, the old uh, saying, and it's true, the, the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. In other words, when things get too expensive because of supply disruption, people can't afford them, businesses close, you get layoffs, you go into recession, and prices come down pretty quickly after that. The other source of inflation is from the demand side. And this is a completely different dynamic. We saw this in the late 70s where... Um, uh, you know, prices are going up, but people have some bargaining power. So unions are on strike. They're getting higher wages. Uh, I mean, I worked at Citibank in the, in the late seventies, early eighties. They used to give us raises without asking. They just say, here, here's another $20,000 because they knew that the cost of living was going up. We would all change jobs if they didn't pay us more. So, but that, uh, that feeds on itself. So the supply side disruption tends to snuff itself out. The demand side inflation tends to feed on itself. It gets out of control. And then we saw what Paul Walker did with interest rates in 1980, 1981, where he took it to 20%. He, he caused a recession in terms of tight monetary policy to snuff out the inflation. But otherwise, if you don't do that, that just runs away. Now, this, the inflation we saw in 2022, late 2021, 2022, it was real. It wasn't transitory the way Jay Powell said. Um, and, you know, the price of gasoline doubled, more than doubled, uh, and all the other complaints you hear, uh, you know, the filling up your Ford F-150 uh, pickup truck went from uh, $70 to $140, which for a lot of people that meant they couldn't eat or couldn't, you know, go out. It was killing demand mm -hmm. and, you know, entertainment, shopping, uh, retail, uh, a lot of other things, which again, tends to snuff it out. So that has happened to, to a great extent. Starting in June uh, 2022, that was the peak, and this inflation has been coming down. Now, it's still too high. The Fed's not done. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to see um, at least one more interest rate hike, um, Maybe, but they're going to leave one more on the table. We'll see what happens in June. I'm not forecasting June, but I would not rule out another interest rate hike in June after the May hike. So, um, because they, and they, Jay Powell's like thinking, how many times do I have to say this? He's given nine speeches since August 2022, August 26th at the Jackson Hole, then September FOMC meeting, uh, November FOMC meeting, um, the end of November, a speech at the Brookings Institution, December FOMC, congressional testimony, you know, et cetera. And every time he said the same thing, inflation is job one. We, uh, you know, we, we've got to get unemployment up, believe it or not. They, they, you know, we're going to have a recession and unemployment's going to go up. Sorry about that. <laughs> but, we, but we've got to get inflation under control. And until we do, what's under control mean? Well, it's 2%. That's their goal. Well, it's, it's come down from 9 to 5. Nice job. But 5 is still a far cry from 2. And it gets harder as you go along. Um, and they're searching for what they call the terminal rate. So the terminal rate, no one knows what the number is. Uh, I don't know because Jay Powell doesn't know. But, um, but the terminal rate, by definition, is it's a rate that's high enough that it brings inflation down on its own without further rate hikes. Um, because so far, they've been raising rates and inflation's been coming down. Okay, that makes sense. And they can keep raising rates and it'll come down more. But is there a level where, you know, we're, we're there, now we can sit tight, the famous pause, and inflation will keep coming down? Mm -hmm. Now, you don't know, because it's not a controlled experiment. You can't, like, do it twice. But they're getting close. So whether it's five and a quarter, five and a half, remains to be seen. But that's the terminal rate. But then... Wall Street came up with this narrative. Oh, yeah, as soon as they're done hiking rates, they're going to cut them. Uh, that, this is the famous pivot we've been hearing about for uh, over a year uh, at this point. No, as far as they're concerned, forget rate cuts in 2023. Maybe mid-2024, you will get back to you on that. Um, but there's one wild card in the deck, which is that's the Fed's plan. So I just gave you the Fed's game plan. It's not, you know, you don't need a crystal ball. They tell you what they're going to do. All you have to do is listen, although a lot of people don't. Wall Street makes up their own version of that. Uh, but uh, but the idea of rate cuts, 
following hitting the terminal rate is, well, rate cuts go down, so dividends look higher, so buy stocks. You know, Wall Street is always buy stocks. That's, the, that's always the punchline. But they might cut rates late in the year, not because it's their plan, not because they want to, but we could be in a very severe recession. Uh, and that, at which point, because the Fed's always late, to, you know, they're, they're always following the market, they never lead the market. Mm-hmm. If they've already raised, let's say they may already be at the terminal rate, not know it. Um, and so if they keep raising, which I expect they will, uh, they may throw this economy into a very severe recession, at which point they may have to cut rates, not because it's in the playbook, but because, you know, unemployment goes up to 7%. And, uh, but that gets back to the, the, the first question, Constantine, which is what's next? Disinflation may be deflation. The answer is diversification. Everyone goes, oh, we, we know that, you know, diversification. But they know the term, but they actually don't know what diversification is. And I'll give you an example. I run into people all the time. They go, well, Jim, I'm fully diversified. I have 50 stocks in 10 different sectors, telecommunications, semiconductors, consumer non-durables, metals and mining. And I go, you're not diversified. You may have 50 stocks, but you're in one asset class called stocks or equities. And they're all going to go up together or they're all going to go down together. And the more stressful the condition, the more reason you have to be concerned about it, the higher the correlation. You know, on any given day, some stocks go up and stocks go down. But when you dial the stress meter up, they all tend to move together. So that's, I don't care about your 50 stocks, your 10 sectors, that's not diversified. So what does real diversification look like? Have a sleeve of equities if you want, that's fine. I would say um, I look hard at oil, natural gas, natural resources, agriculture. Again, kind of equities that have hard assets behind them that will do well in inflationary times mm-hmm. or even in recessionary times because you need all those things uh, no matter what. Um, then a slice of real estate. You know, I wouldn't be in commercial real estate, but you know, residential real estate, um, income producing real estate, farms, etc. That's good. Um, I have a big slug of cash. And people go, well, cash doesn't have any yield. Well, lately, the yields, you can get uh, 2%, 3%, you know, on like a CD. Uh, but even in a simple um, savings account, um, you know, it, it is quite low. It's, it's kind of less than 1%. But people don't understand the value of cash in a couple of respects. Number one, in a deflationary environment, we're not there yet, but we could hit that if the recession gets bad enough. Cash could be your best performing asset. Mm. It doesn't go up in nominal terms, but it goes up in real terms. Mm. If you have 2% deflation, your cash is worth 2% more uh, in terms of purchasing power. But the, but the real value of cash is optionality. Mm-hmm. And this is not well understood. I shared an office with Myron Scholes uh, for six years, so I see options under the pillow, <coughs> so to speak. But uh, um, if you're the one with cash, when things First of all, um, it'll definitely preserve wealth. So if things are falling all around you, your cash will be what it's worth, unless you're in Silicon Valley Bank. It's a separate issue, but um, although they got bailed out. Uh, but so it'll preserve wealth, even if it's not a high, high performer. It'll do very well in deflation. But the real benefit is when everything else is falling apart, you're the one who can go shopping. So it's kind of an at-the-money call option on every asset class in the world. You know, Everyone's selling everything in a panic. You can bide your time, watch it go down, Look for a bottom and then say, okay, now I'll, I'll buy these things down 30% or 40% or 50% from where they were. Um, some alternatives, I, um, uh, you know, I have a number of investments in, uh, you know, private equity and venture type situations and the yeah, other risky, uh, and they're not liquid, uh, but, um, some of them will do very well. Some of them have done well. So that's nice. Um, and then a slice of gold. Um, uh, and I recommend 10%. Uh, cause people, you know, they put words in your mouth and go, Jim Baker says sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. Not a good strategy, but 10%. Yeah.